Scott Shannon is a psychiatrist from Fort Collins, and uh, he's built an amazing program there. And that's what got me thinking about doing the, in, uh, the evolution of psychiatry in Colorado, because there's a lot of innovation happening here. So I asked Scott, he's on vacation in Hawaii, couldn't get out of it, sent his friends to come and speak. Um, uh, but he sent me this video showing exactly how their practice works. So I'm going to start with this because I just feel like this will give you an idea of what the psych psychiatric practice of the future looks like. Hi, I'm Scott Shannon. I'm an integrative psychiatrist and one of the faculty from Psychiatry Masterclass. And today I'm here to tell you about Wholeness Center, a clinic I started about seven years ago. My inspiration for starting the clinic was quite simple. I'd been the medical director of a freestanding psychiatric hospital and run a number of different residential treatment centers, worked at a community mental health center, and had a large outpatient practice. But I could see that I could not meet the needs of my patients. I've been involved in holistic and integrative medicine for over 30 years, and I've seen a lot of the different things that could be done for people, but I never saw them together in one place in terms of treating mental health issues. So we started the clinic with a goal and a philosophy of creating collaborative care where people treated patients, individuals as a whole person, body, mind, spirit, and work together as a team to address root cause and leverage the power of things like epigenetics and neuroplasticity to our greatest benefit. We've created a program where we work with outpatients and we increasingly work with patients from out of the region and out of state in something called the Comprehensive Assessment Program, where people come in for a comprehensive assessment. We start out with lab work, which is both uh, urine and blood. We do a quantitative EEG. When they arrive on scene, they meet with an integrative psychiatrist, a naturopath, a family systems therapist, traditional Chinese medicine practitioner. And together we create a comprehensive picture of what's going on for them. And we pull together a treatment plan that is cohesive, comprehensive, and prioritized. We've got a team of people working that includes a whole range of practitioners. We've got 10 different disciplines represented and we work together as a cohesive team. And people get uh, classes for diet and nutrition, they get IV nutrition, stress reduction, and they get a program that works and is geared to them. We're held together by a practice manager, Leo Salazar, who really makes things hum and work together as a coherent, cohesive whole. And I'm really pleased that we've been able to try to shift the paradigm. On one level, we're simply a mental health clinic. We provide care, we've got 8,000 patients, we provide a lot of the mental health care for the Fort Collins region, but we also are trying to do something very different. And one of the things we're trying to do is we want to invite people to discover themselves and begin a path to healing and wholeness in a way that the field of psychiatry has really never seen before. My personal vision is to change my profession, shift the mental health paradigm, and really move people in a way towards health and healing that has not been part of our tradition in psychiatry. So I'm really pleased at what we've been able to do, and I'm really excited about Wholeness Center. Let's have a round of applause for Scott Shannon and what he's built. His two uh, partners at the Integrative Psychiatry Masterclass are going to be speaking tonight. So you're going to get an idea of what they're teaching other psychiatrists. But, you know, to me, that the collaborative care team, the efficiency of using the naturopathic doctors, the psychiatrists, and the coaches uh, all together in a team and having that cohesive unit, this is the kind of practice that can scale and is the kind of practice that can really solve the root cause of these psychiatric conditions. So very, very excited to see that um, uh, coming together. So, you know, as I was starting to uh, put together this show and uh, we came up, okay, we're going to do the evolution of psychiatry, um, you know, as we like to know here, we try and make it fun, we try and make it interesting. Our goal at the Functional Forum was to try and make something that doctors would want to watch rather than something that they just get forced to watch for CME credit. And so I always like to uh, blood new talent here on the Functional Forum. So, uh, you know, just about when we came up with the idea for this, I saw that video that we shared at the beginning, um, Primary Care Dreams, and uh, had a chance to connect with uh, Jamie Katuna. And I sent her a bunch of things uh, that if you registered for this show, you would have got...
Kelly Brogan's uh, evolution of psychiatry from the third ever functional forum back in 2014 and a bunch of other assets. And, uh, you know, I said, do you want to do a live rap on the show? So uh, <laughs> she, uh, she said yes. And so please welcome to the stage medical student turned rapper, Jamie Katuna. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks for having me. Um, so I am going to perform a spoken word. It's not rap to music, it's spoken word. Um, and it's called Positive Psychiatry. Psychiatry. It is undeniably complex. And there's a lot I don't know, so I can't pretend but I can use a lens of, of paradigm shifts, of transforming this culture from historical trends. In the US now, we use a lot of meds and we overspend, they profit on our dependence. Even though the data shows those who need drugs most are the ones who actually tend not to get them. And so the DSM, it continues to grow from a leaflet to an encyclopedia, but this focus on disorders, it's not really helping people. DSM expansion is just a fraction of what's needed. This is not how we want to build the future, diagnosing symptoms like we're programmed computers, letting Big Farm use doctors like recruiters. Patients are still confused on what they're going through. They feel demoralized with stigmatization because mental health is being answered with incarceration. It makes no sense as the wealthiest nation to not invest in preventive education. But why does society try to turn psychiatrists into drug dealing bad guys? These are allies. We need them on our side. A better way to do health that we could all try is called positive psychiatry. It's resilience, optimism, introspection, family, environment, and social connection. We need to be involved in preventive intervention, not just used to medicate neurosis, making sure there's an underlying diagnosis. The DSM is a human construction. The whole thing used to be homophobic. Mental health care can be better. Physicians leading, patients at the center. But the reason I know we'll succeed with this endeavor is people like you who accept nothing lesser. Thank you. So let's look at some definitions of normal. So I think, you know, in this culture, in a materialistic culture, we tend to think that everyone's having a normal experience, but we aren't. And our experience is probably worse than their experience, right? So, and this is reinforced by advertising, especially direct advertising of antidepressants. Um, so it's important um, in the treatment of psychiatry from a functional perspective, I think, to have um, conversations with patients about what's realistic. You know, life is challenging, life is difficult. There are joys and there are wonders of life too, but not everyone's having a Pepsi commercial ad inside of their lifetime, so. So, conventional medicine and integrative medicine, everyone agrees that if we can't engage people in change behaviors, then the rest of everything that we're doing is a moot point, right? So this is our attempt to help you figure out uh, where people are stuck. In integrative healthcare, we're all midwives of transformation. And people get stuck in the birth canal of transformation. And this is our attempt to help you figure out where people are getting stuck. So uh, basically, this is a river running from the bottom to the top, a river that takes people into their growth process and their evolution and their transformation. And people can get stuck in a variety of places. When people get stuck over here on the right-hand side, they have too many symptoms. They're overwhelmed. They're hunkered down. And you can see that arrow going down to the bottom. They may be dissociated. They're shut down. 
These are people who need help with symptom reduction. Whether you use meds, you use supplements, you use mind-body tools, whether you use psychotherapy, you have to help these people to have fewer symptoms so that they can find the sweet spot here in the middle on the x-axis where they can engage, they can get engaged in their transformational process. The people, when they're stuck on the left, and there's no judgment here, we've all been stuck in all of these places. When we're stuck here on the left, people are over-medicated. They're too comfortable. They're complacent. They're passive. They're... And that might be because of psychiatric medications, but think of anything that people binge on and that will do fine. You know, people can be over-medicated on their TV or their food or their exercise or their work or whatever. Um, these are people who need more access to their feelings. So they need some, they might need some weaning, they might need some help coming down from their favorite numbing substances so that they can get to the sweet spot in the middle where they're engaged with their transformational process. And when people are stuck in the bottom here, in the not yet willing place, they need stories, they need role models, they need paradigms. That's why in my practice, I consider it part of informed consent to explain this paradigm to people. People will make different choices. People will make different choices about their medications or about their treatment plan if they understand that their symptoms have meaning and that the symptoms are part of a journey, just like my journey with the sawdust feeling it took me to a place that I needed to go and moves people into engagement and transformation. It's such a helpful story to tell people and it's so different from what they hear on the TV ads for the antidepressants, you know, where it looks fun and easy and clean and it's available for a low copay. Uh, you know, and then they list that list of side effects at the end in a fast voice, you know, all those hilarious side effects at the end. But what they, the side effect that we worry about that they don't say in those ads is that pharmaceutical numbing may cause you to put your own precious life journey on pause. Right. So we don't want to help contribute to that. So on, on this um, x-axis challenge and support, we, we want to emphasize that we consider love to be defined as the combination of support and challenge. Okay, and that's a little bit different from the cultural message people are getting where if you love somebody, you support them all the time and you never challenge them. And we also th believe that the maximum growth happens at the border between challenge and support. So that's this middle ground here of moving people down, helping people move down the river um, into engagement and transformation. We can't develop resiliency without challenge. Challenge is necessary. So we don't want to take that away. We want to add whatever's needed to keep people moving. Okay, so here's a smattering of uh, symptom management tools that we teach at the Psychiatry Masterclass. Um, we tend to go for the most, um, the least toxic um, symptom management tools. And um, we try not to uh, use medications long-term or at high doses. You know, symptom management could include short-term doses of pharmaceuticals at lower doses. It could also include mind-body techniques, which are not listed here. So there's an epidemic of inflammation and an epidemic of sympathetic overdrive. We have a lot of activation symptoms that we deal with with people. So we're using things off of this list, things that support GABA levels and things that inhibit, uh, that lower glutamate levels in the brain to help people with their overactivation. And we prescribe autonomic nervous system treatments the same as medications. These are very powerful tools that help people to uh, reduce their symptoms. Conventional medicine fails us by prescribing a pill for every ill. If we just prescribe uh, a supplement, even a supplement or a mind-body technique uh, for every ill, that's not substantially different. So it's very important. That takes us to the next important arm of the model, which is the physiologic root causes. Now, all of you in the audience who practice functional medicine and at home um, know this list very well, and this is the same list of root causes that we uh, assess and treat in our psychiatric patients. Um, I think of this like a video game where if you get your physiology optimized, you can unlock deeper levels of the game. We can't predict what journeys people are going to take if they get their physiology optimized, but we can tell you which journeys they're not going to take if their physiology is out of whack. So as we get into talking a little more about trauma, we want to start off with some definitions. For our purposes, trauma is not an event. Trauma is a persistent pattern of dysregulation in the body. 
It's a pattern of dysregulation in the hypothalamic pituitary axis. It's dysregulation in the central nervous system and dysregulation in the autonomic nervous system. I want to point out for the functional medicine people in the crowd that uh, this bottom study here, uh, C-reactive protein, uh, which is a general marker of inflammation in the body, elevated after 20 years of childhood maltreatment. So, Stays elevated for 20 years after childhood maltreatment. Yeah. Yes, for, for 20 years. So um, this, this part of our talk is beginning to close the gap between functional medicine and the new psychiatry, illustrating the point that long-term trauma in the body is mediated by inflammation and autonomic overdrive. Okay, so if you're treating uh, diseases of inflammation in adults, you're probably treating people with trauma. That's one of the take-homes we want you to have tonight. And so one of the things that we came up with was this idea called the future of Functional N5. Everyone has so many amazing ideas about how we can transform functional medicine. So I would love for you to welcome to the stage for a future live future of Functional N5. Uh, she is a psychiatrist also from uh, Denver. She's going to be talking about innovate, innovation in psychiatry. Please welcome Dr. Chanel Heerman. Thank you, James. All right. Hi, everybody. Um, tonight, I'd like to talk about my two favorite topics, which are women's mental health and telemedicine. And for me, these are actually the same topic, so I will explain. Um, first of all, women in our society are stressed. We actually do about twice as much domestic work as men do, including both housework and childcare. And it adds up to a whole extra shift, an uh, extra month per year due to this second shift. Um, more relevant to our, our patient population here, women do 25% less exercise and recreation than men do. So the very lifestyle changes we're trying to get women to incorporate into their lives, they don't have time to do. And because of all these stressors, along with other factors, women are twice as likely to suffer from the most common mental illnesses, being both depression and anxiety disorders. And so what can we do about this? Obviously, there are big societal issues. We'll keep working on those. But as doctors, what can we do right now? I think it makes sense to start with moms because they tend to be the hardest hit. And I think it really makes sense to start with new moms. Um, we've, we've found that 15% of new moms suffer from postpartum depression, which is about over half a million American women. So Dr. Settle and I just recently put out an article in the Psychiatric Times on the evidence-based treatment for integrative treatments for perinatal depression. And what we found was that there's really good evidence actually for exercise, for yoga, and for group models. Um, there's decent evidence for omega-3 fatty acids and massage, and a whole emerging evidence base for a whole bunch of other techniques. I'd encourage you to go check it out online for free, because tonight we are not going to focus on what we can offer to these moms, but I want to talk about how we can offer it. So imagine that you're a new mom who finally decided to go get some help for your postpartum depression. And first you have to bundle the baby up and go out in the cold, especially here in Colorado. Um, you have to find someplace else to take your toddler or your preschool or maybe get grandma to watch them, get a babysitter or drag them all to the office with you. Um, then you drive across town, find parking, juggle that huge baby carrier across the icy parking lot so you can be in a crowded waiting room with your toddler who needs a nap and your baby who's probably hungry and a whole dozens of people who are just waiting to share their germs with your brand new baby. And the trouble with this is now trying to get help for your stress is becoming a stressor in itself. So imagine not having to do this. Imagine just logging into an easy to use app on your phone or your computer, settling into your own comfy couch, maybe grab a cup of tea, cuddle your baby. You can feed in comfort and privacy whenever you want. You can manage your older children with the, their toys in their house. And you still get the benefit of a real doctor who really cares about you and feels like they're right there in the room with you. So now you can get some help without creating additional stress. Um, for the doctor, there are actually benefits clinically. You can see how the mom is interacting with her new baby. You can see how she interacts with her other kids. You can even sometimes see how she interacts with her partner or her spouse. And you can see what the house looks like. It's actually like an old fashioned house call just updated for the 21st century. <laughs> In fact, there are some groups like uh, Niacare here in Colorado that actually does home visits for postpartum moms, and they now have access to specialists like me on demand over telemedicine right there in their houses. Um, there are also a lot of benefits for us personally as physicians. Um, you can actually start to get the life balance that you're trying to model for your patients. So um, 
you can make effective use of your time. If you have a no-show, you can do projects on your own computer at your house or throw in a load of laundry if you want to. Um, if other stuff goes wrong in your life, there's a snow day or you've got a minor cold, if you can make it down the hall, clinic is on. And if you happen to be a mom doc, you can say goodbye to mommy guilt for those sick days where you have to try and decide between your patients and your kiddos. Just get them a babysitter and pop out for a story and a cuddle in between patients. Um, I also find it really helpful for when loved ones really need you. So you've got a seriously ill family member who needs some help, or your best friend just had a new baby. You can actually literally be there for them because you practice over telemedicine. Um, for me personally, there isn't much I would trade for that level of connection and peace of mind that telemedicine has created for me. Um, the biggest question I usually get about it is, does it feel like a real relationship? Is this somehow substandard or not as good as in-person care? And so I wanted to show you something. This is my little stuffed doggy, and this is my pretty bracelet. These were gifts that I got from the public mental health clinic that I used to work at from patients there. So these were low-income women who didn't have a lot of disposable money and decided that I mattered enough to them that they wanted to say goodbye with a present. And they mattered to me, and I mattered to them, and yet we had never set foot in the same room together. So what telemedicine does is it creates real relationships that support real people who just happen to have a little screen between them, and I think that benefits everyone. So I'm happy to answer questions afterwards or on the um, Practice Accelerator Forum on Facebook. And thank you so much, James, for this opportunity. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, so really excited that we got to, to focus on, on the delivery of the care, right? One of the things that became really clear to us last year, that the Institute for Functional Medicine did their first survey and showed that the biggest thing that was holding back functional medicine from becoming the standard of care was just a really obvious inefficiency, right? An hour and a half intake is awesome, and we love the fact that we can spend that time with patients, but... How many people can you really see if you have that kind of system? And so what we've looked to do uh, at the Evolution of Medicine, the first thing that we wanted to do with the Functional Forum is make this kind of information accessible to everyone. You didn't have to go to a conference um, and pay to go there and fly there. You could watch the Functional Forum online forever for free. And then the second thing we saw is, okay, now that we've opened up the barriers, there are still so many practitioners who want to practice functional medicine but just can't work out the model how to do it. And so we started this thing called the, uh, the practice accelerator and um, I wanted to we, we're gonna have a, a bit of a new segment we typically would do the practice transformation tools but I just wanted to show some notes from the practice accelerator uh, here because I feel like um, you know it's very important for us to uh, to look at the models and we've already heard two amazing things that we teach in the practice accelerator one is the provider teams Scott Shannon and these guys working with uh, these teams together so that you can have maybe the naturopathic doctor can do the intake you know it doesn't have to be what kind of physician can you know all the teams can work together the other thing is telemedicine and we talk about that here but um, so this is the accelerator uh, it's uh, goevomed.com slash accelerator to find out more about it. We created it to help practices really work out how to practice functional medicine and learn from, you know, we're in a very unique position here at the Functional Forum is that we're hearing from the whole industry. You know, if you're a physician practicing by yourself, you have an idea of what you're doing and maybe a few other people that you meet, but you don't know what the best practices are coming from across the industry. And so what we did is boil down those best practices. So, you know, we t we've talked already about, you know, provider teams, telemedicine, two really obvious ones, but I wanted to talk about one thing that I think is the core central part of the, um, of the evolution of medicine and particularly uh, patient education, right? So much patient education in the first era of this medicine was done face-to-face, -face, right? Doctor to patient, face-to-face, -face, which is awesome, super engaging, but ridiculously inefficient. And there's so many ways that we can do that now. So the email autoresponder sits at the middle of the practice accelerator, and every efficient practice is delivering information via this kind of service and not via one-on-one -on -one doctor to patient. So a couple of examples. So an email autoresponder, if, you, if you're not aware of the terminology, is just when something happens, like you put in your email into uh, a box and say, I want to get an email, you get a series of emails that come the same for every person that puts in their, their details. And so the reason why it's really valuable is, one, 
you could set it and forget it. At this moment in functional medicine, we are in the world of physician entrepreneurship and being a mum and being a doctor and being an entrepreneur is really hard. You know, we talked about being two, but being three is harder than anything. And so once you set it up and you set up the autoresponder, you know, you can forget it. Every person is gonna get the same predictable stream. Two, you can tell your story perfectly every time. How amazing would it be to visit one of these guys' clinics here and to hear from them that they're not the hoity-toity psychiatrist that is just telling you what to do, but people who have actually been there, right? To have a real sense of empathy, to really be able to put yourself in those shoes. You wanna tell that story consistently every time without it taking up any of your time. And you can do that on you know, the email autoresponder. Two, you can add so much value before the first appointment. Some of the most innovative clinics that we're seeing now in their autoresponders will tell you how to avoid coming into their clinic. Because what they can say is that the whole goal is to empower you not to have to need care, right? The goal of functional medicine is to, is to create an empowered patient who's well and doesn't need any more medical care, right? So if you can deliver some of that learning through an automated system that takes none of your time, there's no downside to that. All the clinics that are doing that are thriving because they are delivering way more value before they ever have an appointment. It's easily shared, I'll share this in a minute, but we've had so many examples of people who send out an email, everyone knows how to use email. Even my 80 year old dad in South Africa, who's watching right now, hi dad, actually it's two in the morning, so he's probably watching tomorrow. Um, but yeah, like he knows how to use email and he knows how to do forward, and if he sees something interesting coming, he might send it to all of his friends. So now you're building in marketing into a structure that was really designed for patient education. And for it saves you time every day after it's set up. And time is the one thing that we can't make more of. We have to get more efficient with it. There is real value in the time that's spent with patients. So all this other time on the education that's needed, let's do it in a more efficient way. People have done handouts. People have done group orientations. It is a really efficient way to deliver uh, information. And if there is an educational component to make the most out of your practice, you need to deliver it in a scaled way. Chanel, I just want to start with you because you've got innovation in telemedicine, but I know one of the things that we're always trying to encourage is group work, group visits, um, the way that you know, groups of people are working together. Can you just share a little bit about how you've managed to sort of meld the world of, of telemedicine and groups? Sure, you bet. Um, I actually started doing groups because it's a great way to get the to get the help to where the patients are. So you can see the patients in their houses, in their offices, and it's a great way to reach populations of people who are otherwise hard to reach, like busy professional moms, um, because then they can make time for self-care if you can bring it to them um, via telemedicine. So um, my own group program actually started back when I, I wrote a book a few years ago um, about the seven foundations of health and happiness, and it was... The core message is basically letting go of perfect and trying to balance a little bit in all the important areas of your life instead of trying to just completely nail one and leave the other sort of neglected. Um, and what I found was is that in working with people one-on-one, -on -one, they actually needed more support to apply it to their lives. And because I had already done some work with groups in um, my training with the Center for Mind-Body Medicine and some other models, it just seemed like a natural fit. So I put together an eight-week program um, that goes through all seven foundations and about a week for behavior change. And then we tested that out in a public mental health clinic in rural Colorado. And we actually just published the results of that in the Journal for Technology and Behavioral Health. Um, and what we basically found, there was a lot of, a lot of results, um, but the most interesting ones to me were the qualitative results. And that's that the patients that felt that it was a practical way to learn stress management skills. They felt that it contributed to their relationships and their quality of life. And the interesting part was that they all, um, there were actually no dropouts from any of our two groups, which if you've ever done any group work, that's really unusual. Um, they all found it very satisfactory. And when we asked them specifically whether they felt that the telemedicine group experience felt real to them, we got unanimous yeses. So I was really excited to hear how much they enjoyed the group. And I love the idea of telemedicine group therapy because you can bring it to wherever the patient is, no matter how far out in the middle of the boonies they, they live, you can bring telemedicine to them. And the group actually cuts down the cost. So more people are being seen at once, so you've got the cost barrier reduced. But then, ironically, they're actually getting more connection time because they're having more face-to-face -face time with the doctor. So it's kind of a win-win on both sides. Plus, you have the power of the group. I really do believe that groups can heal and can help us do things that we can't do on our own, and you get to harness all of that. So I see it as the way that we can bring 
functional and integrative medicine to the masses in a way that's going to work. I think you've just had a, a moment there. That is the future of psychiatry and, the, and really the future of functional medicine, using technology, using groups. Thank you so much for sharing. I think that's really powerful.